Alright, so if there's one thing not to do when making an oil cruet, it would be destroying your pot and leaving the wheel frustrated. But it also happens to the best of us, and it happens to me more times than I'd like to admit. But enough of that, we will just get into it. So I wanted to make a video showing how I make these oil cruets, which is just fancy wording for making a tall, narrow-necked bottle. Um, I've been throwing these for a while, and at this point I don't really use a gauge for the little stop pours that I put in them, but yeah, essentially it's just a bud vase, or what really just makes an oil cruet is that I'm putting a little topper pourer thingy into it. Um, anyways, so right now I'm just weighing out these lumps of clay. I use about a pound and a quarter for each of these, and I cut them out and weigh them all and then wrap them in plastic so I can keep the balls nice and soft as I'm throwing them on the wheel. I don't use my gauge when I'm throwing these, and I just kind of throw them to feel after I get into the rhythm. They all um, just kind of become the same height, and if they're a little bit off, I'm not too worried about it. So I get my wheel head nice and wet, and I throw my clay down onto the wheel. As I'm centering these, I'm kind of pushing down and then squeezing with my hands for the coning up, and just making sure that it's really stuck on the wheel and it's not going to fly off or go anywhere. So now I'm just coning back down, pushing that clay into the palm of my hand with my fist until I have a nice centered ball of clay. And this becomes apparent when the clay is not wobbling, it's not pushing you around, you're pushing the clay into place, it's not pushing you. So now that we've got our clay all nice and centered, I will put some water into that little divot that I created in the top and punch my fingers through not all the way through to the wheel head I leave a pretty thin base and I stretch out with my two thumbs pulling straight across until I have the diameter to the point that I want it I don't bother measuring this it's just kind of eyeballed and muscle memory at this point to get the same diameter for each of these now I'm just compressing the bottom to make sure there's not going to be any S cracks and just to have a really sturdy foundation because that's what you want before you start pulling up your walls. So using my first pull, really just to establish my second pull, I'm not going for a bunch of height here, I'm just trying to even out these walls. I. I'm always stressing this, especially when throwing bottles, but it's so important to keep your clay in this kind of cone shape. You always want the rim of your pot going towards the center of your wheel because as soon as it starts to flare out, gravity is going to want to turn it into a bowl and it's going to be really hard to get it back into a narrow cylinder shape. And now that that's taken care of, we're ready to start pulling up again. So on my second pull, I'm really trying to get most of my height. I am applying a decent amount of pressure and just moving up with the speed of the wheel. I don't want to move faster, I don't want to move slower, I just want to move at a nice even pace with the wheel. Each time I'm collaring these pots, or any pot, I want to have a good layer of water and slip on the outside of the pot, that way my fingers aren't going to stick and throw me off center. Now I'm just taking my handy little sponge on a chopstick here and getting that water out of the base of the pot because I don't want it oversaturated. Each time I'm doing a pull I'm adding water so my fingers aren't sticking to the inside of the pot and I try to remove that water after each pull as well. You'll notice with these narrow forms that it's a lot of back and forth between collaring your pot and pulling your pot and that's because each time you stick your hand in your pot to make a pull it's going to widen it out and we want a narrow bottle, so then we're just going to have to collar it back in. I'm using this little straight edge tool to remove some of the excess clay before I start with my rig. Since I've been collaring and pulling this clay so much, it's at the risk of just being overworked and oversaturated, so I come in with this rib and compress the clay with it and remove some of that slip just to make it a little bit stronger before I yet again collar this thing. There's a theme going on here and it's a lot of collaring, compressing, and pulling. Now I'm really gonna be trying to turn this thing into a bottle. I wet the sides again and I'm really aggressively collaring in this pot to get that nice narrow top. 
The way I hold my hands here when I'm coloring, I like to have as much contact with the clay as possible because I want to have total control over it. I don't want it to be super wobbly, super uneven. And you're sort of forcing the clay where it doesn't want to go, and that's towards the center. It always wants to be flaring out on you because of gravity. So now that I've got it pretty narrow, I'm going to try and keep that top narrow, but I also need to use my rib to compress the clay again and really kind of establish the shape of this pot. Each time that I am coloring in the clay, inevitably you are making it thicker. You're compressing the clay, and each time you compress clay, it's going to thicken up the walls. So I will do a pull for the most part after each time I color. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm just thinning out that top layer and giving myself a little bit of extra height so I have more clay to work with to form that narrow neck. This is my little method for coloring. That's, that's kind of the way that I hold my hands when I do it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to figure out what I'm trying to say here. So again, with that contact, just squeezing that clay inside, you can see it thickening as I'm doing that. So again, I'm going back in, wetting it, wetting my fingers, wetting the outside, and pulling up the walls to even out that thickness that I caused from collaring in the neck. So this thing's kind of starting to look like a bottle. I'm going to use my rib again to remove that excess slip. And I'm not going to work on the bottom of this thing anymore. It's just going to be on the neck. I'll continue pulling, I'll continue wetting it. I don't want to pull it too thin. Once it gets way too thin and you try to collar in a pot, it's just going to collapse on you. The walls get too flimsy. So it's kind of just that, that happy medium with the clay, and that will become apparent as soon as you tried to collar something in and it flopped on you, which has happened to probably most of us. Also, Otto, <laughs> my cat just decided to sit on my lap and he's purring very loudly. So let me just get him out of here for a sec. Okay, so anyways, um, one thing about collaring is that the rim of your pot, each time you collar it, it tends to want to be uneven. And the easiest solve for this is to just use your needle tool and even out that lip. Sometimes I get lucky and it's not super uneven, but in this case, I was not so lucky. So I'll just hold my hands really still and poke that needle through the lip with my finger on the other side, adding stability. And when you use a needle tool, it's gonna to flatten out that rim. So then I come back with the sponge and I, I sort of round it back out. So this thing's starting to look like a bottle. It's starting to look like a cruette. Like I was saying earlier, I don't use a gauge when I throw these and I just try to make them as close as possible. Also like each topper or oil pour are going to be a little bit different. I've been using the same brand for a long time and they have the same width and I'm just used to it at this point. And I throw these just a little bit bigger than I need them because they'll shrink by about 12% after they're fully glazed. So just pulling up the rim again. It's such a constant compress and pull and compress and pull. I remember watching people throw bottles for the first time. And I was always so impressed by how much height you could get out of the neck once you get it super narrow. Um, yeah, that's, that's my little, my walk down memory lane story. <laughs> so now that this thing's all finished up, I'm just gonna use my little wiggle wire and cut it off the wheel head and I'll let these firm up for about a day or two, depending on how cold it is in my studio, until they're at the leather hard stage. And then I will trim them the next day, which, like magic, it's the next day, and they're ready to be trimmed. This is a leather hard chuck. I keep these leather hard because it just makes it that much easier to trim your leather hard bottle. Sometimes I'll wet the inside of them a little bit and it really makes your pot stick and it's not gonna move all around. So just tap centering it into place. I realize also I should, I'm going to make a video on how to make these chucks. I have them in all shapes and sizes because all pots come in different shapes and sizes but this is the one that I use specifically for these oil cruets. So once I got my check center, I stick my oil cruet into it, and then oil cruet, 
and then I'll center it by just tapping it into place and then I throw my little lens cap on top of there so I'm not going to punch through the bottom of my pot. I don't do too much trimming on these bottles. I try to throw them as thin as I can so I can avoid trimming, basically. I just want to create less steps for myself because I'm trying to move efficiently. I'm trying to kind of work quick. I'm also striving for things to be thin because any pouring vessel, any vessel period that's going to hold liquid, all that liquid's going to add weight to it. And if you're constantly picking it up, you just you want it to be a light pot. You want it to start out light because that liquid's just going to add more weight. Now I'm just sort of rolling my trim tool over the edge to give that nice bevel. I don't want these to chip, and I want them to kind of look elevated when they're sitting on a flat surface, and that's what that beveled edge gives it. Using my rib to smooth out the surface, make sure there's no grog really poking through on these. I want to give it kind of a nice burnished finish. Rolling back over that hard line that I made with my rib using my finger. Sometimes the hands really are just the best tools. And on that note, that's that's my oil cruet. I'll let these dry until they get bone dry, and then I'll load them in the kiln for a bisque. And I've been spending so much time talking about these toppers, these pours, that it would be wrong if I didn't show what they <laughs> what they look like first. I'll drop it. Okay, there we go. These are called spill stops, I believe, and they sort of have like that rubber gasket on the bottom, so you can get away with making them a little bit smaller or a little bit wider, the top of your bottle, and it gives you some play. It gives you some forgiveness in that sense. I would rather make them a little bit too small than too big, because if it's too small, it's just gonna make it a tighter fit. Here's a finished one. This one was wood-fired, so it looks a lot different than that one on the right, but yeah. That's it, that's pouring nice as it should. That's just water, obviously it's not oil. <laughs> and there's my cruet. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this video was somewhat helpful and not just me rambling. Um, until next time, please like and subscribe and comment below with any questions, thanks.